Of course, one of the big discussions right now is uh, surrounding our schools because the governor uh, recently did make the recommendation for schools to possibly close for two weeks for remote learning uh, due to the surge in cases here in the state of Michigan. But uh, some schools are not doing it. Uh, they feel it's, they you know, for them, every school is different here in the state of Michigan. But boy, I have to tell you, it must be really hard for them with so many mixed messages. Uh, to talk a little bit more, let's bring in Ken Gutman. He's uh, the superintendent for the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. Are you as confused as I am? <laughs> you bet, Ronnie. Absolutely confused. You know, if I, if I can expound on that. We've been incentivized to return all students to school, and it has always been our goal to do so. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, it was very clear through PA3 that we needed to return, or at least our high school students, to school. Now, or that all students needed to be returned to school. And now, of course, uh, you know, the governor recommended last Friday that we close our high schools for two weeks and, and stop athletics. What you've seen across the state, and I would say the majority, well, overwhelming majority of districts have not uh, heeded the advice of our governor and we've chosen to keep our kids in school. And there's no disrespect intended towards our governor. I understand the desire to keep everyone safe. At the same time, we're doing that. We have a self-imposed threshold in our district. If a building hits 10% of students and or staff who are either quarantined and or positive, we do close the building. We've not approached that at our high schools at all. And so, and, and, and what we're finding from our perspective is the transmission that we're, we're contact tracing is not occurring in schools. And so we're comfortable staying open and hope that uh, we don't end up closing our schools down again or, or being mandated to do so. You know, superintendents are not health professionals. We don't claim to have special knowledge in that regard. If it's important enough to close us down, then we should be told to close down. But uh, we're very comfortable being open right now and know that we're providing a great education for our kids and a safe environment and again, we have a threshold. If we hit it, we close. I'm sure it makes for a lot of conversations with the parents and the students when you decide to stay open. You're having to explain just this over and over again. It, it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's confusing. And what we've learned throughout this pandemic is things change day to day, hour to hour. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we must adapt. And we are. But it is certainly confusing. And, and it feels like we get mixed messages, and, and I'm sure some of the messages we send out feel like mixed messages as a result. With that, um, one of the issues that recently came up, too, is uh, we know standardized testing is happening. And so in the timing of those tests as well, um, you know, of course, uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Education did deny uh, Michigan's request to try to waive the annual standardized exams. So... Are you doing the test? Because aren't they like this week and next week? <laughs> they are, and, and, and they're a couple week period, actually, several weeks, several weeks. And yes, we're doing them because we have to do them. The difficulty is throughout a year of, of a pandemic, we need to be teaching, not testing, especially when we've been told these tests don't count and then not all students really have to take them. We have to offer them to those who are in person, not those who are, those who are at home don't have to take them. Those who are in person really don't either. So we're spending several, several weeks uh, testing students when really we should be teaching them. And it's not about accountability. The key is that we have local assessments and we use iReady, which is a, a more of a national assessment or a, a self, uh, self-guided self assessment, self-adaptive assessment. That's a better indicator of what our students know and what they're able to do. But certainly, yes, we're in compliance, Ronnie. We're giving the tests. and. Uh, it's just unfortunate that this year that's a requirement. Because I'm thinking from a resource standpoint, it's taking away from some of those other things that you could be doing to try to play catch up throughout the, because of the pandemic. It is for sure. It is for sure. This is a time we need to be teaching, not testing. So uh, with that, uh, can we talk a little bit about uh, vaccinations? We know that teachers were on the front lines. Are they more comfortable now going back into the classroom? I think it's really an individual thing. I think you find a lot of people who are more comfortable being vaccinated, obviously, but there are still some who are nervous in any environment. And we know that the, you know, the, the vaccines aren't 100%. It's really an individual measure. Uh, I, I know that I've heard from a lot of teachers who are vaccinated that they feel a lot better and others still are nervous, but uh, they're still doing a great job teaching our kids. Our, our staff has been incredible throughout this, uh, throughout this, this last year, especially. 
and uh, nervous or not, they're in there teaching their hearts out. So how does it work? Do they basically have like a monitor where they're teaching to the kids at home, but also teaching to students in the classroom? It's different by level. That is our secondary model. At the secondary schools, there is a monitor and they're teaching students at home. We call it the roomy and zoomy model. Uh, they're teaching students in the room, and other students versus uh, on Zoom. The elementary level, we do have some virtual option that is not involved, uh, that they don't have the students in the classroom at the same time. But yes, we use that model at the secondary level. We're talking with Ken Gutman. He is the uh, superintendent for the Wald Lake Consolidated uh, School District. Um, so as we continue to go forward, we know one of the big struggles, substitute teachers and just employees in general. Any movement on that front or still a struggle? Still a struggle. Substitute teachers, bus drivers, food service employees, we could use them all. And if I may just throw in a cheap plug, call 248-956-2000. Ask for our human resources department and say you want to work in one of those positions. We will get back to you immediately. We are definitely in need of all of those positions. Yeah, I was talking with a bus driver and their days are long because with a hybrid model, they're you know coming and going. It's, it's just confusing for so many people and they're really putting in a lot of extra hours uh, right now as well. They are, and with the shortage, we have some of those people running our department, driving buses as well, and, and, and pitching in custodial, and custodial positions and all of that. I mean, it's a really tough time to find people who want to do these jobs. And so we're grateful for the extra time they're putting in. They're hard workers, and we really appreciate them. It contributes to the success of our district and the kids. So with substitute teachers, what are the qualifications that are needed? Oh gosh, I wish I had had that. I wish I knew you were going to ask me that, Ronnie. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't recall what our qualifications are because it changed. The, these qualifications have changed over the last couple of years. So I can get that answer, but it won't be today. It won't be while we're on the air. Uh, but I know the the requirements are lower than they've been in years. And anyone who has questions should call us. And I know that the people who know that answer will answer the phone. There you go. Well, and I will say I I have a girlfriend who, um, because she was you know in retail and with the pandemic and everything, you know she was laid off. So she ended up um, becoming a substitute teacher. It was she wanted to be a teacher for years. So she has a background in social work as well, and she loves it. Uh, so there are some people that are now saying this is great but how does the scheduling and everything work and do you need like math teachers over english teachers or history teachers we'll take any substitute teachers right now our teachers leave great lesson plans to, so they'll be able to teach whatever they need to teach and work with our students but uh, those who have questions about whether their qualifications would meet what we need should really give us a call we're happy to sit down with them and, and share what we know and, and uh, get them involved in our school district. And we'll take anybody who's willing to sub who meets our qualifications, regardless of whether it's math, social studies, or, or anything else. So uh, with that, I know that there has been a push uh, in Lansing to try to come up with kind of new requirements for substitutes to be able to open the door because it's surprising to me, a lot of people now are not going into education, especially men. And we need teachers but again, it's, you know, you ha there's an education process, so you have to go and get qualifications. And they're trying to switch some of those. So maybe if you have real life experience, you could start to teach as well and not just be a substitute. Do you think something like that would help fill in the gaps? It would help a great deal. I know there are some working on fast paths or fast tracks to, to becoming certified in education. The difficulty is we have about two-thirds less, two-thirds fewer people entering colleges of education right now. At the same time, we see statewide the retirement rate for teachers is up about 44 percent. So we see a crisis on the horizon with filling education jobs. Now, personally, I'm doing my best to fill those jobs. Both of my sons are going into education. They're both in colleges of education right now. So those two positions ideally get filled, ideally. But, uh, but we're, we're looking at a crisis on the horizon right now in terms of filling education positions. And uh, we're okay in Wald Lake right now. We're probably okay in Bloomfield and West Bloomfield and those districts you touch, but it's only a matter of time before those leaving, their positions can't be filled. There aren't enough people coming in. So we really hope that uh, whether it's the fast track to, to education certification, uh, a way to, to share how wonderful this profession can be in a normal year, uh, those types of things would be, 
Well, <laughs> it's a hard year to convince someone they want to teach. Most definitely with that. And it's like you said, so many people are retiring uh, because of that. But I do think one thing that we have all learned throughout this pandemic, teachers are vital. They are so important, and they are teaching our kids in the next generation and our leaders. So whether you have kids or not, it is an important profession. What can we do to try to get people excited to go back into education again? And that's the struggle. We, we need to be able to share the success stories and share what's great about the profession. We need to be able to sell that. And, and, and I don't mean sell that in a disingenuous way. It's really a great profession. And as a former teacher, I actually taught in the West Bloomfield schools. I loved my job. I loved teaching. And, and you know, there are days that are tough. You've got to re reach, uh, meet the needs of every single child, and that's the goal. Uh, and certainly anybody who's considering it as a profession, I'll sit down and talk to them as well. I, I know Dr. Hill will. I know Pat Watson will and Bloomfield. We're all looking to, to share how wonderful this profession can be. Uh, my, uh, my, my hat goes off to and my heart goes out to all the teachers this year and all the administrators and the bus drivers and transportation, and custodial, our secretaries, everyone who's worked this year uh, has found it to be a struggle in education, but it's been a struggle outside of education as well. And so um, I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to consider a career in this wonderful profession. So Ken, uh, what's been the response since you guys have returned to the classroom from the parents? I, I have a lot of happy neighbors right now because we are a neighborhood full of kids oh, <laughs> and yeah. a lot of relieved parents when they get back in the classroom. Yeah, you know, we left an option for those who want to remain virtual to remain virtual. And those who are back are pretty happy to have their, their kids back in school as long as we can keep them safe and we've done so. And, you know, we've had to close some schools and we will again probably this afternoon as we approach our threshold, some elementary schools. But parents are by and large reporting that they're very happy their children are back. As much as we believe that we did a good job with virtual and do a good job with virtual education, there's no replacement for most students for an in-person education. And I think our teachers find more satisfaction meeting with students in person as well. And because too, I feel like they really get to know the students so much more and they can see when they're struggling. It's easier than when they're sitting at home uh, on Zoom. It is for sure. And it's hard for our secondary teachers right now to see body language, especially if a student turns a camera off. But even with cameras on, when you're teaching students in person and virtually, it's really hard to be able to, to assess body language, assess feelings. You can hear that sigh when a st student's had enough in the classroom. You don't always hear it on Zoom. Right. Uh, Ken Gutman with us here on the Megacast, superintendent for the Wald Lake uh, Consolidated School District. Um, how's the budget looking? I always ask you that, and it's like... You do, <laughs> uh, and, and predictably, I don't know. <laughs> and the reason I don't know is we don't have our budget for next year, and look, I, I'll be honest, our federal funds help. The federal funds we've received help us a great deal, but we still don't have a budget for next year. And I had a chance to ask the governor uh, two weeks ago uh, if she'd be able to comply, she and the legislature, with the June 30th. We have to pass a balanced budget by June 30th, they need to get us a budget well before that. So um, I don't know that I got a solid answer in terms of whether we'll have it because I don't think she knows and the legislators with whom I've spoken are, are hopeful, but uh, we would love to have a budget from the state by June 1st because we need to submit a balanced budget by June 30th. So how does it look? I, I hope to know at some point in June what next year's budget looks like. That's a message to the legislators, work together. Come it up is. with the compromise. Hey, uh, before we let you go, I do want to touch on uh, you have a golf outing coming up in June. We do. Our Foundation for Excellence does a fantastic job supporting teachers in our classrooms. Their money goes right to the classroom. June 12th. June 12th is $130 per golfer. It's a good time. You don't have to be a good golfer to play. I'm evidence of that. But it does raise money that goes directly to the classroom. It's at Edgewood Country Club again on June 12th. Uh, how can they get tickets? They can go to uh, wlcsd.org slash foundation. And, and uh, go ahead. It, and it's great. To, uh, we can all golf safely. So absolutely. We'll be outside. And I generally hit the ball where no one is. So it's all safe for me. <laughs> well, that's great to know. King Gutman with us here on the Megacast. So we always appreciate your time. Anything I didn't um, ask you that maybe you want to say before we sign off? 
No, I think as always, Ronnie, it's been great talking to you and I uh, just appreciate everything you do to help us share what's going on in the district. Well, good luck to you and your team. I know it's not easy and every time these uh, rules change, I think about uh, people such as yourself and the team over at the West Bloomfield School District because having to make these decisions at the drop of a hat, a little bit complicated. A little bit, but we'll continue to adapt. We'll, we'll interpret the rules and we'll take care of our children. So one of the things I will say uh, quickly, uh, coming out if they pass the um, infrastructure bill w is addressing broadband. So there could be something good that comes out of this pandemic. We would like that. We would like that a lot. And we, we have to take advantage. I, I don't mean it to sound bad, but we need to take advantage of what we've learned during this pandemic and look at how we offer instruction in the future there may be greater opportunity for virtual instruction uh, for those for whom it's a, a positive thing. And there are those students who really thrive in that situation. And we ought to look at when we offer classes and can we offer classes at night? And can we offer them on the weekends, especially for our secondary students? There's a lot to learn and broadband uh, access would help. And I will uh, also say maybe recommend they need two computers, one to watch <laughs> Zoom and one to actually work on. That would, yes, absolutely. Ken Gutman, we always appreciate your time. Thank you again. Likewise, thank you.